Hello everybody, I'm ZSK Ravala from ZK Research and welcome to the special AI Disruptor edition of Zcast. I'll be interviewing key executives from disruptive companies that are using artificial intelligence to create a tailwind to help disrupt the industries that they play in. Today I'm joined by Jayshree Alal, CEO of Arista Networks. And Arista is an interesting company because they actually disrupted the network industry uh, when you were founded almost 15 years ago now, right? By using software as a disruptor. And today you're looking to do it again with artificial intelligence. Uh, so Jayshree, before we get into this topic, just a quick introduction on yourself and Arista. Zayas, you need no introduction, but as you know, you and I go back way, way, way long ago. Yeah, way back. Back, <laughs> back when the market for networking was practically zero, and now it's 150 billion or so in the time, maybe doubling with AI. So I've been involved with this industry, not just in years, but in decades. And when Silicon Valley truly was built out of silicon, and I got a chance to build some of these networking chips, and now in networking, man, I feel like we've gone from an evolution to a revolution. So it's great to be here and great to have this discussion with you. Yeah, it's been interesting watching the evolution of networking as well, because I think, uh, you know, prior to being an analyst, I was actually a network engineer. And in those days, nobody really thought of the network as a strategic asset. Uh, but today, clearly, the world is network centric, artificial intelligence. I think this is one of the things people don't fully understand. It's also network centric. And so I think we're moving to an era where this. The, the choice of network now absolutely matters for how your business operates. So from what I've seen, you know, I think um, AI is no more just a hype. It, it's artificial intelligence can actually be real intelligence. And it's outpacing the reality of things we can really accomplish, not only on the network with killer apps, but in terms of enabling the network with this rising tide we call AI, right? So let's. Let's take a look at, as pioneers of our data-driven architecture for networking, what we've really done. The first thing we really did was bring these cloud principles, not only to the cloud, but also to the mainstream enterprises. In the cloud, we had a lot of you know, engineers who could deal with the automation, and yeah. we, it, it's been very much a relationship of engineers working with engineers, co-developing great things together. Availability, automation, analytics, you name it, right? But when you look at applying those strengths in the enterprise, there's really three major things we're focused on. Proactive platforms that bring hitless of upgrades and resilience at every level. And back in my day, and your day again, hitless upgrades and resilience meant buy two of everything. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, that doesn't fly a lot with our customers, so we have to provide alternate parts for everything, which is a little bit different. The second area is zero-touch operations, where we really have a hands-off non-manual, hands-free, I should say, operation, where software-driven networking, SDN as we called it, relies less on human stuff, and we can truly automate everything, you know, and bring down the automation of your network from hours and days to minutes and seconds. And the third is this prescriptive insights, where, once again, you can use AI and ML to really assist. We call this autonomous virtual assist, and it can bring increased security, observability and root cause analysis. Yeah, that's, uh, in fact, the, the evolution of networking along those lines to be more automated, more zero touches, is a relatively recent phenomenon where you think of other parts of IT have been have embraced that you know, a decade or so ago, and it's, uh, it's, it, it's been interesting to see networking in some ways catch up to where Look, the rest of the IT right. is. you're absolutely right. Sometimes I feel like, why am I making this old thing sound new? But it's new to networking. Yeah. We, we always had one software for backbones, one for branch, one for campus, one for data center. And the ability to bring from client to cloud across multiple customer sectors, one OS, one management entity, has earned us the top spot at both Forrester and also Gartner with the voice of customers. So we feel very proud of it because I think it is a architectural shift for networking, yeah. but as you rightly point out, not so new for the rest of the industry. Yeah, so the hot topic today uh, is obviously, you know, in, in any part of IT, no matter what event you go to, is artificial intelligence. Now, from an infrastructure perspective, there's a lot of media focus on the GPU, right? And that's stolen a lot of the headlines and a lot of the, the industry tailwinds. And of course, this is GTC week, uh, and I, I'm expecting 75,000 attendees, wow. I think, in total there. Yeah. Uh, so, but it is worth noting, though, that the network does play a critical role in AI. Now, the impact to networking is twofold, right? There's AI for networking and networking for AI. And I know you talked about that last investor day, but if you could 
go into some detail on what those two are and how they're different, that'd be great. Very well said, I love it. Networking for AI and AI for networking, that's great. Well, as you know, artificial intelligence is already a key tool for us. Through our Awake acquisition, we developed this AVA, Autonomous Virtual Assist, and we have natural language processing techniques and very high fidelity to improve and assess threat mitigation, root cause analysis, observability that you, you wrote about our Numero Uno launch, yes. right? Um, so this was great. Now there's networking for AI, which is really, like you said, making these GPUs come alive. By the way, I don't know why the G in GPU still stands for graphics. Graphics, I know. Yeah, <laughs> Should, shouldn't it be APUs or something like that? Yeah. But anyway, we'll leave that alone. What is this, accelerated computing? Right? Is that what it is, yeah. the A? Okay, perfect. Well, yeah. So slow or poor performance in GPUs and AI means lost revenue, right? The job completion time is huge and it's driven by this frequent, intense, computational, data-intensive communication, where the AI training, which is the killer app, depends on these large language models and how quickly you can complete the job cycle. A good network is critical to make these GPUs hum because if you look at the total GPUs and you reduce uh, the uh, efficiency time by 30% and you have 30% idling, you've got millions of dollars of GPUs now idling. And a good network more than pays for itself if you can avoid yeah. that. Yeah, it's funny because the relative cost of the network is pretty small when compared to what companies are spending on their AI infrastructure. I, I did see a chart uh, once, I think it was in an NVIDIA event actually, where it showed a, a pie chart of the data scientist day and it was start your model, go get coffee. <laughs> Check on model, go get coffee. And I think your point on the downtime that happens or the idle time uh, especially when you think about what you pay a data scientist, is really the killer for companies and it makes, it takes AI from, from something that is transformative to something that just costs companies millions of dollars. You know, coffee's cheap, but those GPUs are expensive, <laughs> yeah. right? So I want to just get a little down and dirty and techy with you for a moment and say there are three things in the network you can do to make those GPUs come alive. The first is add a lot of scale, right? There's the all collective operations, whether you call it all reduce or all null, and these are the dominant collective types. So today's models are already moving from, you know, a billion parameters to a trillion parameters. And whether you're talking about Google Gemini or open source Llama that Meta just uh, launched in a blog here, or Tesla's Grok, every one of them has this compute, exchange, reduce data cycle. And the volume of data exchanged is so high that any sl slowdown in the network performance is, is really damaging to the AI application. So I'm going to take us back to history again. I'm reminded of the old days in the 1990s where we did spanning tree. Yeah. You know, we don't talk about spanning tree and loop formations anymore to eliminate that. But that eliminated loops and created network scale at multi-megabit rates. And then in 2010, when Arista pioneered cloud networking, we went out of spanning tree to N-way, a layer two, layer three technologies like ECMP for multi-gigabit speeds yep. in the cloud. And once again now in the 2024, 2025 era, you're talking about a network topology where every flow has to simultaneously access all the GPU connectivity paths. And, and you have to almost be infinitely scalable in, the, in that way. Right? Yeah, they call that multi-terabits, high radix, you know, but think about this. AI will be supporting a radix that goes from you know, how many of our GPUs are available today, which you all know are an allocation, to 100,000 GPUs to a million GPUs. So Arista plans to bring that massively scalable, high radix, non-blocking congestion control mechanisms to the network, and that's key. The second key one, if I might go on, is latency, sure. right? Increasingly in AI, it's all about that rapid bulk transfer from source to destination, and the AI applications, the way they're done, you, you need to know that that poor receiver doesn't have multiple uncoordinated senders. So message latency, in some ways, is more important than packet by packet latency. So, you know, flexible ordering mechanisms and guaranteeing that predictable latency is, is fundamental. So there's a lot of work going on there in the network. And finally, scale, latency, and the third one is congestion control mm -hmm. mechanisms. Um, this in-cast problem of everybody coming to the same receiver is a non-trivial one and especially at the kind of high speeds, you've got to have the right buffering, and you've got to have the right um, throttling, almost, uh, to manage these collisions. Because any collisions is slowdown of your job completion, and there you are, once again, idling those precious diamonds, otherwise known as GPUs. Yeah, I do think uh, over the years we've, um, uh, 
uh, almost managed around congestion. Yeah. Right. But I do think it's something now that uh, isn't something you can manage around because it actually impede the performance of the business. Now, when you when you think about the AI for networking and networking for AI, um, can you comment on how big the, the TAM is for those segments? Well, I'll probably get some criticism on this question, but I'll try. Okay. <laughs> um, you know, when I was at the uh, investor conference, there was some answers that said um, it's a f the GPU market is a $400 billion TAM. So if you assume networking is 10% of that, it should be 40 billion, right? But, you know, I think it's important to understand how you're measuring the TAM. If I'm measuring all the AI traffic that goes across the network, I can't even keep track of that. So I'm being well, that's a little- everything. That's everything, yeah. exactly. Just like I never knew what porn went on my network, I don't know all the AI <laughs> that goes on the network, right? So the real root issue here is, if I look at 24 and 25, how many times do I know I'm actually directly connecting to the GPU? So we talk about front-end networks that do the normal compute and uh, you know indexing and querying in the anatomy of a network, and then the back-end, which is really the GPU, right? And over there, I think the, the TAM is twofold. First of all, it's not just the GP, GPU connection, but there are a lot of small networks that are still connecting to PCI Express or CXL. And then there are medium networks that are connecting to traditionally familiar technology like InfiniBand. And now you're gonna see the real high radix networks connecting to Ethernet, but that phenomenon has just begun. I have been pretty much outside looking in where majority of these have been bundled with InfiniBand until now. So what we've signed up to, we think our numbers are going to be around 750 million in 2025. And the Ethernet market, according to market reports, is probably a couple of billion, but obviously, you know, uh, m multi-billion in the future, so yeah. mul m tens of billions in the future. Yeah, so that'll be an interesting thing to watch uh, because every company does have a different definition of it. And I, and I do agree with you, just because you're passing AI traffic, um, it doesn't mean that's networking for AI, right? And so I do, it's gonna be, uh, to, to me, the, especially from an investor standpoint, to be able to cut through what one vendor says versus another to be able to create somewhat of an apples to apples comparison. Yeah. Now, when you think about AI for networking, um, or sorry, networking for AI, yeah. uh, InfiniBand has been the tried and true technology for a long time. And in fact, uh, yeah. computer engineers get very comfortable with their technologies. Right. Now recently, Ultra Ethernet has made an appearance and Arista is one of the founding members of that. So I've heard the argument before, uh, back decades, that Ethernet would eventually uh, displays InfiniBand and it hasn't happened. So can you explain why it's different this time? No, that's a good, really good point. First, I want to say InfiniBand is very, very good for HPC clusters. And I, generally speaking, was in the past lower latency and higher performance. Ethernet was always a little behind because it didn't need to be high performance. It was good enough performance for yeah. mainstream networks. Well, in fact, but, uh, Ethernet was built on the concept that good enough is all, all you need, right? Exactly. Yeah. And, you know, Ethernet was working on collisions and how to remove them and become a distributed switch, et cetera. But Ethernet, at the end of the day, as you and I know, always wins over Ethernet technologies, as Bob Metcalf calls yeah. it, right? Because it's you're building it over 15 to 25 years. In fact, I think it just celebrated its 50th anniversary of distributed control plane, open standards, a huge amount of tools, billions of installations. And one more point, it's highly connected with IP. So if you ever want to connect your back-end network to your front-end network, you don't have to reinvent an adaptive routing or create proprietary protocols to do that, right? So high availability, standards, all of this is possible with Ethernet and the associated IP. InfiniBand is a vendor one. It was defined by the uh, InfiniBand Trade Association, and there was a lot of work that went into H HPC, but you know, take a look at its routing mechanism. It's not IP. It's defined by single, single subnet manager. If that subnet manager goes down, the whole network goes down. It's brittle. So it can be great for small networks that are 256 nodes or whatever, but in general, you wouldn't bet your career on these large training models unless it was the only choice. And good for us, Ethernet is once again improving and living up to it. its billing and going one more step for 400 and 800 gig. Yeah, I do think at a minimum, customers want choice. And I think one of the differences this time, too, is in years past when we've tried to redefine Ethernet to replace InfiniBand, we didn't really have the, um, the support of the hyperscalers, right? Because they were in their infancy then. And I think in, in, in a lot of ways, those are the companies now that are driving a lot of the change. So. 
Yeah, I'm excited about Ultra Ethernet. I think it's going to really deliver, and you, rarely do you see this many companies getting together, the world's smartest pe people agreeing, and you know, debating, arguing, but actually coming out with a spec. So I think we're going to have a spec by the end of the year, and we're going to have Ultra Ethernet products uh, next year. Yeah, well, that's another big difference. Is in the past uh, getting some of you network vendors to work together has been difficult, yeah, but yeah. I think there is a common goal here. Yeah, very so, much so. So let's pivot a little bit and talk specifically about Arista. Okay. Uh, talk about the design thesis that Arista had when it first was founded and allowed you to to, to really dominate the web scale environment and and then that translated into large enterprise, and how that translates, though, into to AI. I'm going to go back to a story. Remember, and I came to Arista. You know, I, it was 30 engineers and a handful of us who were figuring out how to, how to go to market. And we had the world's lowest latency switch. It was running at 500 nanoseconds when the rest of the world was in microseconds. And the story at that point starts with, you know, you cannot build the old design that back in the day we, we all had done, which is access aggregation core. This is still the primary three-tier design yeah, to build networks, crucial. right? And I still remember the inspiration of forming Google, um, Arista was a Google RFP that said, give me non-blocking. Huh? We never did non-blocking back in the day. You know, give it to me in a two-tier architecture for 1,000 to 10,000 nodes. And oh, by the way, give it to me at 10 gig for $100 support. Not a single vendor including Arista, who wasn't born there, could do, do that. But it inspired us to think of what's going on, what's wrong. And Google had to go off and build their own. Amazon had to go, but they built their own. And this just doesn't scale, ultimately. And that's why Arista was born. Arista built this modern operating stack that's been you know, programmable at the data plane, management plane, control plane, but really made SDN come alive by you know, really fulfilling those three parameters, not only for 10 gig, but then of course for 100 gig, and now 200, 400, and 800 gig. So our story was built on cloud principles, collapsing from three tier to two tier, active active, high radix, massively scalable performance for the cloud titans, as we call them. Yeah. Now, now we can do the same, not only for the front end of the network, but we can, we can bring those same concepts for AI to the back end, and so yeah. we can you know, explode those rail-based designs across multiple planes and carry sort of an M by N plane where you can not only build a leaf spine network, but you can carry it across one rail or two planes or three planes all the way to eight planes and significantly once again improve the radix. So I think the beauty of our architecture is it's not brand new anymore. It's the same OS, it's the same network data lake architecture that's data driven, but now we can pull it from the front end all the way into the back end to connect to compute and storage, and of course, GPUs. And uh, give a little more detail on the data. Obviously, when it comes to AI, data is a critical component of uh, AI promise, right? Being able to, and uh, I know Arista has uh, been managing network data for, you know, since okay. you were founded. So, right. so talk about, though, uh, how you're managing the data, how you think about data and the role it plays in AI and being able to help your customers uh, deploy it faster. I love your questions because I have answers for them. <laughs> but So thank you for that. But you know, there is no AI strategy without a data strategy. Yep. And a data strategy has to be the way you think of your platform and architect it right from the beginning. And so I like to say, you, you said our company was 15 years old, but I'd like to tell you our fifth software is 15 years new. Because we've gutted the foundation three times already. Hmm. We started with a published subscribe model that we call SysDB where you know, anytime there's an agent and an agent fails, we can automatically see that that agent has failed and do fa automatic fault containment, fault repair, and spin up an agent. Then we went to NetDB, where we could do this network-wide across right. all our switches. And then in this last, I think, when was it? November 2022, we added a network data lake architecture and built this data-driven platform. And this flagship software has this network data lake foundation, right? And this data strategy allows us, it's well underway, because now you're not just connecting the network, but you can bring flow data, you can bring structured data, you can bring unstructured data, and you have this continuous integration of CI, CD principles. And not only can we connect our products to each other through for our customers, but third-party ecosystems can also benefit from this. So, you know, people talk about a platform, Arista built a platform, and now we're seeing the use cases come to us for that. Yeah, when I think about what makes Arista unique in your ability to service AI, to me, it is that data lake. When uh, there's an expression in data sciences that says good data leads to good insights. Uh, the, if that's true, then the corollary is true, 
where silos of data leads to fragmented insights. And I, when I think if you're pure set, a lot of your competitors are built on acquisitions, they have different product teams, and so the structure of the products is different, and so ostensibly what they have is a bunch of silos of data. Yeah. And so if you can't bring that together under one data set, I'm not really sure how you would actually do effective AI across the network. It's very tempting to do acquisitions, but one of the first things you have to do even when you do an acquisition is understand their role in connecting to our foundation. And often we find that, that's, that if you don't make that pivot fast, then you end up doing the same thing you just described, which is creating oh. more silos. So, so you know, whether it's an acquired company or whether it's a brand new product, you, know, you have to take a deeper look at the strategy, whether it's for AI, data center, campus, when, and make sure that all of these behavioral patterns and insights, as you called it, are, are visible and you can act upon it. The ability to, to action, actionably do something with them is equally important. Yeah, now you're a very technical CEO, which is one of the reasons why I like talking to you. So uh, let's take a deeper look, though, at the anatomy of an AI compute node to help understand the role that RIST and the network plays in that environment. Yeah, you know, I um, I get excited about this. I think <laughs> you do too. And you know, uh, hopefully a CEO doesn't mean we suspend our brain and just talk about <laughs> blue sky or you know financials. But um, when I look at a standard server, a standard compute server, it's generally a two socket or a four socket server, the CPU as we know it, right? And I think the CPU is the basis still of a lot of our front end networks. That's not changing. Intel, AMD, they're all benefiting from that. But now it's becoming the back-end control as well for a lot of your uh, planar effectively indexing, querying, et cetera. But then the centerpiece of the back-end for AI, which is, I think, new to all of us, but what I'm now discovering is a thing of beauty, is this fleet of GPUs. All of them have to handle these model parameters. And by the way, we talked about a lot about training, but this is going to apply to inference yeah. too. Today we're taking the highest problem, which is training. Then there's the question of, okay, what is the role of a server? You got the CPUs, the GPUs, but then you need to get out as fast as you can outside the server into the network so you can connect all of these GPUs, because within a server, you might be able to connect eight or 16, but you can't go too far. So that's where the connection to the NIC or the network interface card through PCIe or CXL or any kind of server comes in. And finally, there's the top piece, which is that high radix AI spine or leaf spine or, you know, over, over time, we'll be building a distributed ether-like, ether-link spine that's UEC compatible, where you can have these large scale-out collectors for a fleet of GPUs. So I kind of see this as a tiered architecture, and the faster you get out of the server and build a scale-out network, the more efficient those GPUs will be. All right, Jay Shree, I think this uh, takes the end of our time. Let me sum up this. So, um, uh, you were built on software principles, right, for the Cloud Titans. That's roughly the same architecture used for AI clusters, but you're managing latency congestion and massive scale, yep. right? You're taking, uh, you've taken your data into a data lake that allows you to do AI faster, more accurately than your competition. And then you're able to drop that into an AI cluster using ultra ethernet or even regular ethernet right. to allow companies to build out these networks for AI faster. Anything else you want to add? I love it. Beautiful <laughs> summaries, yes. Thank you for having me today. It was no, great. No, thank, thank you. It's always it's a pleasure. pleasure. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks. So, Jay Shreel, I'll CEO of Arista Networks. Thanks for joining me on this. I'm Zias Caraval from ZK Research, and thanks for watching. Please hit that subscribe button, and I'll see you next time on the next episode of Zcast. Mm -hmm.